It's time for another segment of our Luke study. I want to welcome all of you, either watching live or uh, those that will watch uh, after the fact. Glad to have you interested in the Bible, uh, interested in this intriguing gospel. I've enjoyed studying from it, teaching from it so far. I look forward to continued study. Uh, if you looked at some of the study questions that I posted on our Facebook page, uh, kind of see some short segments we'll go through here in Luke 5, verse 17, starting with Jesus forgives and heals a paralytic. Uh, that order is going to be important because he does heal, but uh, he forgives not after the healing, but also before. And so that's going to be a controversial thing. It'll get him in some hot water. Uh, we'll see Jesus, the Son of God, get through that and uh, give a defense and explanation for all the things that he does. Let's get into our study, Luke 5, verse 17. Let me read down uh, through verse 19. We'll make some comments and then cover a little more territory. Now, it happened on a certain day as he was teaching, and there were Pharisees and sad, uh, teachers of the law sitting by, who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. Now, before we go on and look at some other details and kind of some twists and surprises along the way, this is during, obviously, a time of some popularity. And so Jesus, a uh, certain day, we don't know what day it was, but he's teaching, and there are ones who are interested, they're sympathetic, uh, very uh, open to what he's saying, but also some that weren't so much. One of the good questions is, as you study through your New Testament, and uh, Acts would, uh, would fit in, um, in as far as the New Testament book as well, who were the Pharisees? Pharisees, it's kind of hard to know where they, where they got their start, but uh, they were kind of the separatist, the separated ones. They were conservative, generally. Uh, and so Jesus, some of his, his skirmishes, his conflicts about religious questions were with the Pharisees. Now, the other major group, the Sadducees, we'll see them later uh, in Luke's Gospel as well. And then there were what were called teachers of the law or lawyers. Lawyers, not in a, a civic sense, not as uh, that occupation that we identify with, but as religious lawyers, experts in the law of Moses. And so these Pharisees, teachers of the law, were sitting. <coughs> they had come from several different regions. And it mentions Galilee. That's generally where Jesus is. I think it's Mark's gospel as you compare uh, Matthew 9 and Mark 2 to this uh, parallel account in Luke 5. Uh, it's in Capernaum. Let me get a sip of water here. And so they were there. There were people from Judea and Jerusalem. Judea is going to be the geographic area <coughs> of which Jerusalem is a part. And so the ones from there had traveled some distance uh, to come and to hear Jesus, maybe to engage in controversy or conversation, depending on whether they were antagonist or protagonist to our Lord there. It says, not surprisingly, as he's teaching, some healing goes on as well. The power of the Lord was present to heal them. Jesus could have healed exclu exclusively or taught exclusively, but on many occasions it is some of both. And the healings, I'm convinced, were uh, a, not a, an end to themselves, but a means to an end, that is to instill uh, an interest and, and to create an awe about his power, to make people uh, again inquisitive about who this man was. And if he was able to heal, surely would that not indicate that he was from God or uh, some type of a su supernatural power was behind him? And so on this occasion, as there is a throng, a multitude pressing him, that uh, there was a man in the crowd who was a paralytic, paralyzed, some versions have there, he had at least four friends. It's not uh, this gospel that records the number of them. And and so they brought him on a bed. So I think of the bed. Don't don't get a four-poster bed. Don't imagine a wood frame and, and a mattress and a box springs. This would have been uh, something more, more Spartan than that. It could have been more than a bedroll, but maybe like a at least a thin mattress or something. And so four are able to bear the corners of that with, with him laying there. And it says because of the crowd, they couldn't get into the house. 
kind of wonder about some of the hearts of people as they uh, very obviously hear someone wanting entrance or getting closer to Jesus. We don't care about these people. You know, the, these paralyzed, you know, if he could walk, maybe he would be worthy of hearing. But but, but you kind of wonder at the hard hearts of the ones that uh, were uh, not as, as open to, get, to getting him in a clear audience or at least a direct audience with the Lord there. So thinking about the ingenuity of these men, they, they climb up to the housetop and they, they open the roof. It talks about the tiling there. As we understand uh, their construction methods, they wouldn't have had roofs uh, in the way that ours are, certainly not shingles in the sense of those overlapping. It's not that they have to, to even uh, destroy the roof. It, it's a, probably a matter of taking out a, a segment there. It talks about the tiles. And so, uh, yes, there would be some homeowner's claims there, but uh, it was worth it. And it would probably be patched easier than some of the holes in our roofs. And so, uh, Imagine the disruption, Jesus knowing full well what was going to take place and even anticipating uh, this, uh, this unusual thing. Look what he does in verse 20. Let me read down through verse just 20 and, and 21. When he saw their faith, he said to him, man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? The first thing that Jesus said was to them, he saw their faith. And, and I think maybe it's just a nod to at least five people, uh, the four that are carrying him and the man who is paralyzed himself, the faith of them to be in a position, of course he could read their hearts, if I can get him down in the presence of Jesus. I know there'll be some some inconvenience, there, there'll be some, some work involved in that, but I think the, the confidence that he could be healed, maybe relieved of his paralysis if Jesus were part of the equation. And so he saw their faith, but he said to the man, to the individual, your sins are forgiven you. Does that shock you? Does it surprise you? Is that uncommon for Jesus to do that? Well, it is. He, uh, he speaks his sins forgiven before he even addresses the point of paralysis. I don't know the, the man's background. We might presume he's a Jew. Uh, I don't know if he felt convicted by his sins. Some have even conjectured that his sins were responsible for the paralysis. We can't know that for sure, certainly. But Jesus says, your sins are forgiven you, knowing full well the effect, not necessarily on the man, but on, on his enemies, specifically on his critics. And sure enough, the scribes and the Pharisees as it says, they began to reason. They're not verbalizing this. They're not shouting this outwardly. They're merely thinking it, maybe a little buzz or whispering among themselves there. Who is this who speaks blasphemies? In their mind, what Jesus said was the highest offense. Who can forgive sins but God alone? They had a good point, didn't they? Let me uh, make an application. If I were to tell you, if you were to come to me and express something on your heart or some struggle, problem, sin that you're dealing with, if I were to say, well, I forgive you of your sin, would I have the right to do that? Would, would anything happen? The clear answer is no. I'm not the son of God. I have no power at all to forgive, to absolve someone of their sins. Incidentally, neither does a priest of Roman Catholic faith or any other faith have the ability to say to a person who's made a confession to him, your sins are forgiven you. Now, I can't say if they're not in a relationship with God. Now, here's my point. I can pray for them, but I realize that it is God who does the forgiving. and It's only through the blood of Jesus that they could be forgiven. I don't have that right. But when Jesus says your sins are forgiven, he's not saying on the basis of you offering a burnt offering. He's saying that I have the prerogative, the authority. My claim is that, that your sins can be relinquished merely by my saying that, th that thing. No wonder the scribes and the Pharisees watch it if Jesus were merely a man. No wonder they were up in arms. God alone can forgive sins. And so kind of uh, tying this together, Jesus is indirectly claiming to be God. He is showing or making the connection that if he can forgive sins and it's only God who can, then, then he is God. That's a simple uh, 
series of dots uh, for us to, to cross there. Now, Jesus perceived their thoughts. Incidentally, he still reads hearts. He doesn't need for someone to say outwardly what they're thinking or feeling. He knows what they are. But he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Exactly. I know what you're thinking. You, you couldn't possibly hide that from me if you wanted to. Which is easier, he asked them, to say your sins are forgiven you or to say rise up and walk? Which is easier? Did any of them have the power to heal? Had any of them... Uh, healed a person of paralysis? I think they would kind of drop their heads and have to acknowledge, no, it's beyond our scope or our power. But Jesus says, none of you would forgive sins either, would you? No, it's not within their power to do it. But Jesus first forgives, drawing attention to that. And then in the next place says, but that you may know that the Son of Man, phrase if I remember right, that occurs for the very first time in the book of Luke, at least, here on this occasion, the Son of Man. Beautiful term. He's not saying that I'm not the Son of God. He's at least indicating his identity with humanity. That you may know, not just guess or be reasonably assured, but know that the Son of Man has power, authority, prerogative on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. You talk about a, a, a quiet moment. All eyes on this, this verbal back and forth. And now when Jesus, after having already pronounced sins forgiven and said, you know, what one equates with the other, healing would point to the ability to forgive and vice versa. He says, uh, and what, uh, what an amazing thing is at stake. Had this man tried, and, and you can see him struggling, and then the legs just aren't working. Everyone could kind of either start laughing mockingly or, or cast Jesus out or maybe even try to kill him on the spot. But no, not surprisingly, immediately, verse 25, he arose, rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, I love how one commentator says the the bed had borne the man, now the the man bore the bed. He picked up that mat uh, and he departed to his own house, just as surely as Jesus said. Now, glorify God. As he did that, can you imagine, what if you never walked? What if you could only dream as, as you watched as a young person, the, the young kids out skipping and jumping and running thinking, boy, that would be awesome. And you look down at those legs that just just have no power in them, and you think, wow, what, a, what an awful thing that would be. But then imagine this stranger that, first of all, forgives your sins now as you've grown older, and, and then as you've kind of given up hope over the years and kind of become accustomed to not walking, when he says to you, take up the bed you've been lying on, go back to your house, Walk back. You don't have to be carried back. You can walk back. Wouldn't you glorify God? Wouldn't you say, what an amazing thing has just taken place? I want you to see the reaction by the crowd there. It says they were all amazed. All of them were. Maybe even the ones who were critics of Jesus, the Pharisees and the scribes. They were all amazed and they glorified God. They gave glory to God. In other words, they realized that what had happened was from the power of God. And they were filled with fear. That probably means not scared fear, but all inspiring reverence uh, for what had just taken place. Wouldn't every day that you would see something like that happen. In fact, except for the power of Jesus in his ministry, you'd never see that. Wouldn't have happened before by the religious leaders. It wouldn't happen after it unless some of those apostles or early Christians had been given the power to heal and do it. But again, it was all because of Jesus, not because of them. And so they said, among other things, we have seen strange things today. Strange things. There are a lot of strange things that I've seen, you've seen, that are not good strange. They're kind of just weird or sometimes even bad. But they mean it in the sense of kind of a, this is a paradox. This is an unusual, maybe it's a, a good translation for us. Indeed it was. It's not often. 
Now, and we can think of surgeries, perhaps, as someone who's been paralyzed. We can think of spinal cord injuries and how that that is still a field in which there is so much more uh, to be explored and, and so much uh, improvement to be made. But for the ones that maybe have a reversible uh, type of damage, isn't it wonderful to see a person maybe rehabilitate or find some kind of new lease on life? But to realize that immediately Jesus caused this without a some, some underlying physical condition or hindrance, it was merely that he, without a, a moment's hesitation, gave those legs, those nerves, whatever the issue was with the man, the ability to supernaturally uh, change from what would have rendered him motionless to all of a sudden walking. And I like to think about stories like that and how it affected him and his family, if he had family, and the four men who carried him. Can you imagine containing the excitement and the zeal for those that have witnessed that? Wouldn't you want to tell others about it? And although Jesus isn't present in 2020 here in our neighborhoods to heal, the story is still relevant. We can still tell folks about what Jesus did back then. And, and above all, listen, forgiving sins. Was it just this fellow that Jesus cared about forgiving sin? No, everybody. Jesus is doing an amazing thing. In fact, the most amazing thing that day, I don't know that you could convince the, the former paralytic of that, the, the greatest thing that happened that day was an insight into Jesus being the sin forgiver, the iniquity remover. That was the purpose primarily that he came for anyway. And so it is wonderful that we can go out and tell people, you know what, I'm a sinner like you are, but I've been washed from my sins. I'm in a relationship. As I sin and I confess those sins, First John 1, the blood of Jesus keeps on washing me from my sins. And so don't you want to have the, the clear conscience and guilt-free life that, that comes through Jesus and what he's done? We can be telling folks the very same thing that I think uh, Capernaum was abuzz with back in the first century. We got time for one more segment here in Luke 5. Let's look in verses 27 through 32. My heading says Matthew, uh, the tax collector. After these things, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he left all, rose up, and followed him. This Levi is the same as Matthew, the, the Gospel of Matthew written by. And so Luke also records, for whatever reason, the call of Matthew here. He's a tax collector. What do you remember about tax collectors? If you have the King James Version, it's the older word publican, not a republican, but a publican. They were notorious. They, they had a reputation, and it wasn't a good one in the first century. And most of them had earned the bad reputation. You see, these kind of agents of Rome would collect taxes. No one really enjoys paying them now as, as they did back then. But, but they were notorious, a little bit different system than what we have today. I guess a, a lot different. But these men that would personally collect them would actually tack on. They would inflate the amount owed. And uh, it would be hard for a person to, to kind of argue their way out or, or to resist that. You were kind of at their mercy. And so uh, many of them were wealthy, and they gained an advantage there. You think about Zacchaeus, uh, the wee little man we'll encounter later in Luke. And uh, when he actually says about following Jesus, I am going to restore fourfold what I have taken that was wrongfully uh, collected there. So he's, he's a change man. And so thinking about 12 men who would who would affect the world positively, would you choose a tax collector? Would that be a little bit odd? Especially when another of the apostles is a zealot, when he is so strong in favor of Judaism that any uh, person sympathetic as a Jew to the Roman cause would would be an immediate enemy. It's amazing how Jesus was able to to bind together a cohesive unit through such different personalities there. And so, Matthew, I want you to follow me. Levi, one of his alternate names there. So he rose up and he followed him. It says in verse 29, Levi gave him a great feast in his own house. This might have been a farewell party. It says there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them 
And their scribes and Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Tax collectors and sinners, almost a phrase that, that, that was synonymous in, the, in their terms like that. Now here's Levi, who doesn't even think twice, at least as the scripture records, and says, sure, I will follow you. And Luke is the, the one gospel of the three that says he not just left it, he left it all. He didn't say he left most or left some, we'd still be impressed, but he left it all. He's turning his back on his occupation, a very lucrative one in those days, and says, Jesus, whatever you're selling, I'm buying. I'll take it. I don't know where I'm going. This is, this is truly a venture of faith, but I'm ready to begin that journey. Let's have a, a farewell party. My, my friends and, and business here, tax collectors, are there. You can almost see, I, don't, I doubt any of these were really invited. Maybe they're, they're just there on the fringes watching, and they can't wait to try to show Jesus up. And, and again, to, to give him another dig. Isn't that interesting how people did that? Jesus had critics all throughout the Gospels. Jesus has critics today. That's interesting to me, too. Sometimes we, we want to avoid criticism. We think if we're ever criticized, that that is a bad reflection on us, or we've done something wrong. Not necessarily. Because if Jesus, the perfect Son of God, was criticized unfairly, I'll, I'll probably be criticized sometimes fairly, and maybe sometimes unfairly, but, but Jesus says you can just about expect it. And so criticism says more usually about the one who is on the dispensing end than the other on the receiving end. Why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? Let me tell you why he didn't eat with them. It wasn't to approve of any wrong that they might be doing. It wasn't because he uh, associated with them and actually in, indulged in the things that they were doing that were wrong. It's kind of a weird sentiment in, in uh, I'll say, Christian in, in a loose way circles that, that kind of is encouraging um, uh, even followers of Jesus to, to mingle with the world, even to the point of dabbling in the things that they're doing. Somehow, uh, as I've heard it explained, that, that makes us relate to them or makes us more relatable. That wasn't what Jesus was doing. You, you don't find that in, in this story. You have to want to force that type of fit there. And so, why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? And the simple answer Jesus could have give was, not because I approve of them, I'm trying to help show them a better way. In his strength, able to, uh, to be a good influence, a positive one. I need to be around sinners. Part of our, our mission, our evangelism, means that we go to, to lost sinners. We're saved sinners, but we go to them. But for some, if... If, if I am so weak, if I'm surrounded by that type of influence, the danger is I could go back in. Uh, I could be swayed for some of the ones that were formerly friends that are still doing things that are wrong. And so I need to be careful, I need to be strong enough that I can resist that, but certainly reach out to sinners. We're going to close with these words by Jesus as a defense and really an answer to the question. He answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. A couple of things going on with that. I guess I've, I've commonly interpreted or heard it explain what Jesus says. Those who are well have no need of a physician. Those who are sick, these people are sin sick. Uh, I need to reach out to them. I'm the great physician. But you know, there's a possible... Uh, Offered an explanation, or maybe both of these kind of are at work here. Jesus may be saying, okay, you are the religious leaders. You're the ones that feel threatened by my presence here. Have you reached out to and ministered to these sick people? You're the doctors of the law. Do you care enough about them? You know, some doctors could refuse treating a sick person, but that would be common. I think Jesus is saying, I'm doing what you're not doing. I'm showing the true love and concern. The another, another way or angle at looking at that is he's not saying that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes, the, the religious elite of his day were like those who were well. I don't think he's saying that at all. I think he may be actually saying you're sick, but you don't realize it. These people are sick and they know it. 
And so uh, they're, they're in the fertile field for evangelism and my work there. I've not come to call the righteous. Well, who'd you come to call? Sinners to repentance. Does Jesus care about religiously good people? Yes. He's not saying I'm unconcerned about them, but, but I think he's at least saying you are the self-righteous in your self-righteousness. That is at least one sin that you need to repent of. But he knows that sinners of all stripes, all backgrounds, are being called not to continue in the things that they are doing in the world today, that is a, a, clear, uh, a clear line of demarcation we must continue to draw there. I cannot tell any person in sin, in rebellion to God, you are okay. You keep doing what you're doing. I don't have that right. Jesus didn't do that. And so for even religious people, it's repent, change your heart. Let godly sorrow, 2 Corinthians 7.10, lead you to an investigation and, and a thorough inventory of where I am. I must repent. That's hard work. It's hard for me to do before I come to Christ. And listen, repentance is that thing that we as Christians continue to have to do. I'm continuing resetting my mind, my heart, uh, my, my life, so that when I've been astray, I can get back right. And only then am I going to have a blessing from God. And Jesus is still in the blessing business. I don't want to be self-righteous. I don't want to be critical of others in an ungodly way. I think for a lot of us, maybe that's the veil over our own eyes. We, we don't see our own judgmental spirit, our, our critical nature. We might be guilty in principle of doing some of the very same things that these religious leaders were, were guilty of. And so it's not a matter of of uh, either being on, on one side of the pendulum or the other. I need to, to see the truth is, is between the extremes there. I've enjoyed studying with you from Luke 5 about Jesus healing a paralytic, forgiving his sins, which is a huge window into why Jesus came, and then looking in defense of reaching out to sinners. We'll continue Sunday night, Lord willing, I'm sorry, Wednesday night in uh uh, Jesus' question about fasting in, in Luke 5, verse 33. Thank you for studying with me. I hope uh, something was said to spur your interest and, and want to cause you to dig deeper in the Word of God, too. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we love you and are thankful for your Word. Bless us as we study and bless us as we live out uh, these truths and these principles we find in your Word. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening.